If, like me, you enjoy endlessly staring at images of space and getting lost in the majesty and the colours and the beauty of the cosmos, well, I have some news for you. All space images are technically taken in black and white. Now, that's not to say that the colour in these images is fake as such, because this is actually how all cameras work, from the camera in your smartphone to the fanciest of DSLRs. The majority of the time, these images are coloured so that they reflect exactly what your eyes would see if your eyes were as sensitive as these telescopes are. To understand this properly, we're going to need to understand actually how the cameras in telescopes actually work. So all digital cameras work using the exact same physical process. It's called the photoelectric effect. What happens in the photoelectric effect is that you have a photon of light, i.e. a particle of light, that comes in and hits some sort of material, usually silicon. That silicon will be made of silicon atoms, of protons and neutrons in the centre, and electrons around the outside. When the photon comes in, it gives the electrons around the outside enough energy to actually escape that material, taking with them some negative charge and leaving the silicon positively charged. If you can measure that charge, then you know how many photons of light have actually hit your material and you get a, a digital reading of, of how bright something is. Now before digital cameras, we were all reduced to using photographic plates or film to do this, you know, film that was covered in a chemical that was very light sensitive and when it was exposed to light, it would burn away and it would give you a negative. Thing is though, these photographic plates and film are not great for doing science because you can't get an absolute measurement for how much light has hit it. All you can do is get a relative measurement comparing it to other objects in the image. So there's a huge push from astronomers sort of in the mid 20th century for electrical engineers and physicists to invent a digital detector. This led to the invention of what we call charged couple devices in 1969 by George E. Smith and Willard Boyd. Now by the late 1980s, all new telescopes were fitted with these CCDs and photographic plates were on the decline. A digital detector is essentially a tiny microchip which is split into a grid of pixels or like buckets with which to collect light. When light falls onto one of these pixels, it causes the electrons in the silicon atoms that make up the microchip to be released by the photoelectric effect and therefore charging each pixel. Now, although the detectors used in cameras and on telescopes are very similar, the way they actually measure and therefore read how much charge has hit each pixel is very different. So in a camera in your phone or like a little handheld camera, it reads all of the pictures at once. Therefore, it's incredibly quick because when you take a photo, you want to basically be able to see it almost immediately afterwards. That introduces a lot of noise into the final image though. Most of the time, we won't notice that noise in terms of the everyday usage of cameras. But for a telescope, you don't wanna be adding noise to your scientific data. The telescope detector reads the pixels one by one which is great because you have much less noise. You do not want to be adding noise to your scientific data. You can also have much more sensitive pixels as well, which is also great. But obviously it takes a lot longer to read out the final image. We literally call it read out time. And it can be sort of on average about 10 seconds, but up to maybe even like 30 seconds. And honestly, it's one of the most annoying things about like going observing and using a professional telescope is just sort of like sat there waiting for your data to read out after the exposure is done. You're just there like, come on. But the principle is essentially exactly the same despite the different ways that the detectors read out the image. So why are images taken by a camera in color and on telescopes, they're in black and white? Well, even in cameras, the pixels themselves are colorblind for want of a better word, but the light coming into them is split into red, green, and blue light that's recorded on three separate detectors. Red, green, and blue are like the primary colors of light, unlike with paint where it's like red, blue and yellow. With red, green and blue light, you can make any color 
of the rainbow that you would like. You might have noticed this maybe when you're on your computer and like you're selecting a color with like the little dropper and you have the color wheel. It's all a combination of how much red, green, and blue you have in the color. So the camera records the red, green, and blue light separately on black and white detectors, reads all the pixels on each detector at the same time, colors them either red, green, and blue, and then adds them back together to give you your final image. So technically, your camera also records black and white images if not for some clever processing going on inside the camera itself. So for astronomy, I've already said that the detectors we use read out slightly differently to give us more sensitivity and less noise in our image. Also, we tend to have more pixels as well, and more pixels is more expensive and also longer to read out. So it's just not feasible to have three separate detectors where you read each pixel individually and then you combine them within the detector itself to give you a, a color image made of red, green, and blue. Instead, we just have a single detector and we switch out the filters and take an image one after the other. So for example, we will take an image through a red filter that only lets in red light. And we'll expose that image for either 10 seconds or 10 minutes or 10 hours, however long it takes to collect enough light from the object we're trying to observe. And then we'll do exactly the same thing through a green filter that only lets in green light and then exactly the same thing through a blue filter that only lets in blue light. These filters are called broadband filters because they let in a broad part of the spectrum or rainbow of light that we can see. We then do a lot of processing on each image as well to remove lots of sources of noise either in the detector or telescope itself or maybe scattered light in the atmosphere. And then so once we've got those what we call reduced images, i.e. they have been reduced from their raw form to remove all of that noise, then we finally take those three black and white images we've got, red filter, green filter, blue filter, color them red, green, and blue, and then add them together to give us what our eyes would see if they could, just in the exact same way as your camera does. So it's as true to color as any color that your camera or phone can produce as well. It's just that the objects we often take images of are so far away and so faint that your eyes would never even be sensitive enough to see that anyway. So what we're trying to do is reproduce the closest we can to what your eyes could see if they were that sensitive. Now, having said that, that's not the case for all space images. Things like galaxies and nebula give off more light at very specific wavelengths because of the elements that are there. For example, in a mission nebula like this one, the hydrogen gas is glowing at a very specific color or wavelength. This is because light from the central leftover star in the middle there is hitting the electrons in the hydrogen gas around it and causing those electrons to jump up one of these energy levels or electron orbitals as we call them in chemistry. When that happens, it doesn't wanna be there, it's not supposed to be there, so it drops back down again. Now, because those two energy levels are always separated by the same amount of energy every time, so says quantum mechanics, a photon of light with the exact same amount of energy is released every time, which means it will have the same wavelength and therefore the same color every single time. So some of the most common elements that we see doing this are, yeah, hydrogen because, well, it's the most abundant element in the universe, but also things like oxygen and sulfur and even nitrogen as well. They emit light at this very specific wavelength, which is why we call these things emission nebula. So much so that if we were able to plot the amount of light at each wavelength that we receive from one of these emission nebulas, it would probably look like this with huge spikes coming from the specific colors that hydrogen and oxygen and sulfur give out. Now the amount of light that we receive from each element tells us something about the physics of what is going on in this object. So it's really important to be able to record how much of that specific color there is. We do this with narrow band filters. So instead of the broad band we had before, we just have filters that only let in a small chunk of the spectrum or rainbow of light around the color that each of these elements is emitting. So then the exact same process applies, right? You just take the black and white image that you've taken through a filter, this time a filter that will only let through, say, the light from hydrogen, and you'll color it 
the color that hydrogen will give off and then you'll combine it with say the oxygen one and the sulfur one and you'll get an image of what's going on in the galaxy or the nebula. The problem comes with the fact that some elements give off very similar colors. So for example, hydrogen and sulfur both give off a reddish color. So if you colored them both red and combine them, you'd actually lose a lot of the detail and a lot of the physics that tells you what's going on there because you often need more energy to excite the electrons from different atoms than others. And so if you color them the same color, that actually wouldn't be that helpful in terms of making the image. Instead, what we do is we line them up from reddest to bluest in what we call chromatic order. And then we set the reddest as red and the bluest as blue. And then we set whatever's in the middle as green. And usually that can be hydrogen. So even though hydrogen gives off in the red, we'll color it green so that we can separate it from sulfur. Doing it that way means that, okay, it might not be true color, but it does mean that we can pick out the detail that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to before because it just would have been washed out in the 50,000 shades of red. It's one of the reasons why space images look so spectacular because you can pick out that detail that's been specifically highlighted so that your eyes are able to pick it out. Think about an infrared camera, you know, the kind that you can attach to your smartphone and see where, you know, leaks in your house are, or you can use sort of in a science class to see the heat left over from a handprint. The light that that camera is recording is in infrared. It's redder than red. We can't actually see it with our own eyes. So the image the camera returns has to be colored so that we can see it in the first place. Now, what color they choose is obviously very important. This is infrared, so they could just choose, again, to color it in 50,000 shades of red, but you would lose a lot of the detail. So often infrared images are shown in this sort of rainbow from the coolest in blue to the hottest in sort of reddish and even white. Now that problem obviously affects astronomy images too because we don't just take pictures in visible or optical light, you know, the rainbow of light that we can see. We take it across the whole spectrum of light from radio, microwaves, infrared, into the UV, X-ray, and even gamma rays as well. They all work with exactly the same principle. You have a detector in your telescope that detects how much light has hit that detector, but specifically in that wavelength that you're interested in, whether it's microwaves or X-rays. All they're really recording is where there is light and where there isn't light. To really be able to see the contrast and the difference between that, we of course add color to those images. We can do that in one of two ways, right? Again, if we have a number of filters, say three filters, we can order them again in chromatic order and color them red, green, and blue. Just like in this infrared image of Saturn that's been taken with three different broadband filters, but in the infrared this time rather than in the visible spectrum. And again, now you can see a lot more detail on the surface of Saturn that comes from the longer, the redder wavelengths of infrared and the shorter, the bluer wavelengths of infrared. But that's not just limited to like one regime like the infrared. Say you're observing a galaxy across the full spectrum of light and you have an infrared image, uh, an optical, a visible image, and then an X-ray image. You could again, order them in chromatic order from the reddest, i.e. the longest wavelength in the infrared to the bluest, i.e. the shortest wavelength in X-ray. Again, color them red, green, and blue, add them together, and what you would get is called a composite image. Like this one, one of my favorite composite images ever of the galaxy Messier 101, where the infrared light from the Spitzer Space Telescope is shown in red, the optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope is shown in a yellowish green, and then the X-ray light from the Chandra Space Telescope is shown in sort of that bright blue purple. So know that anytime you see composite image, that's what it means. Often though, we don't have multiple images of an object in astronomy, we'll just have one, because the better use of our time is to take one image per object and then move on to another object so that we have a big spread of objects that we can study all together so we understand sort of the, the differences and the variances in, in a population of, say, galaxies or stars. When you only have one image, it's all about how you display what is essentially data to best highlight both the faintest and the brightest features. 
It turns out it's very difficult for the human eye to pick out both of those things if how you've shown it is in a scale gradient from just black to white. Instead, we use color and often like a color scheme that might go from say a reddish orange up to the brightest of whites. For example, images of objects in radio light like this one looking towards the center of the Milky Way or even the famous Event Horizon Telescope image of Messier 87's supermassive black hole. They won't be shown in black and white. They'll be in screaming color. Also, our eyes are able to see all that intricate detail where the science is, be able to pick out what's going on in even the faintest of features in this area of the universe. And the upside of that is that they look absolutely free and fantastic at the same time. Now, although the photoelectric effect is the same, now, although the photoelectric, photo so we'll take an image through a filter that only lets say red light through and we'll expose for, you know, 10 seconds, 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, maybe, no, not 10 days, Becky. Although, well, maybe you would expose for 10 days. I guess I wouldn't with galaxies, but some people might, like cosmology people. I mean, the Hubble Ultra Deep field was like months worth of observations. So, okay, now we're just getting off topic. Except the problem is that both hydrogen and sulfur, sulfur? <laughs> I went a bit little west country there, like on my tractor with some sulfur. <laughs> no, no when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day.